السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Welcome to brothers and sisters, Muslims, non-Muslims from around the world My name is Bilal Abdul Kareem and this is Face the Truth We are here today because we are going to discuss with you a very, very important topic Now, the point of this show here today is to inform you and motivate you so that we have uh, an actual game plan in terms of what are we going to do. Now today we're going to be talking about the <coughs> ongoing onslaught here in Idlib in northern, city, in northern Syria. More than 600 airstrikes, I'm going to say this number again, 600 airstrikes, 10 hospitals destroyed, 11 masjids destroyed, more than 200 killed, more than 350 injured. And that is, is just in the last week. I'm going to say that again. That's just in the last week. Now, here my guests today who are going to try to help me to help you to understand what's going on out here. I'm going to introduce them in just uh, one brief second. But before I do, please, everybody watching out there, feel free to comment. Feel free to send in a question. We've got the people here who can answer these questions now. So now is a good time to send it in. My guests here are... Tokia talks Sharif, and he is from Live Updates uh, from Syria. And first, I want to say to you, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And in addition to that, we also have uh, <coughs> another guest here, and he is Dr. Shajul Islam, and he is one of the foremost uh, muhajireen doctors here in northern Syria. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right, everybody. Uh, we got a lot of ground here to cover, so we might as well get right down to it. Um, you've seen, I'm going to start with Dr. Shajul. He works in the medical sector. Uh, you, I don't have to tell you the figures because you see them. What has your work been like the past <clears throat> seven days? Below, you know, uh, I want to start by saying I, I, I noticed you quoted 600 airstrikes. I can tell you for sure there's definitely been more than 600 airstrikes. So I'm not sure where you got that from, uh, but I just want the audience to know that I would disagree with Bilal, hope you don't mind Bilal. There's definitely been way more than 600 airstrikes. Now if you're saying 600 in the last day or two, maybe. But in the last week, we've, I, would, I would put the estimate well over 1,500. Uh, and it has been quoted by other sources which I will share with you. Um, this week has been very difficult for a number of reasons. I mean, getting bombed is not unusual, you know. But, Unfortunately. Uh, sadly. Mm -hmm. Seeing injured is not unusual. But what is different this time, Bilal? I'll tell you what is different. The Russians are using very advanced um, fighter jets, some new helicopters. This is not something we've seen before. And I'm telling you, the precision of some of these rockets when they're hitting our hospitals is shocking. And they're hitting our medical facilities. And how precise these shots are, we've never seen it before. Before they were so random. And it's not random anymore. So that's one of the things that is different. And of course, it's, it's difficult seeing there's so many injured p civilians we've been getting and the hundreds of people that have been killed over the past week. But I just, I don't know how I can explain to you how, how it's really been. It, it's been very tough, Bilal. It's been very difficult for us from the past week. Now, what about you? You work in a different field, so you're seeing a different perspective. What has it been like just in the past week for you? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I feel, I, I would agree with the doctor, I feel it's been a systematic attempt this time to really destroy the infrastructure. I mean, one of the cases that we saw today is that you're seeing life savers, people who are going out there to save people, uh, for example, the civil defense forces and uh, rescue workers, uh, doctors like the doctor here. These are the people that are being targeted. They're being punished, in effect, for trying to save people's lives, which you know, it takes it to a, a new level of, of, of evilness, in a sense. So you're seeing much more 
uh, double tap strikes where people are going to save people and then they're getting hit and taken out. Ambulances are being targeted, hospitals are being targeted, um, schools are being targeted. Um, it's a systematic um, situation where they really want to punish the people who are staying in these areas and, and, and they don't want anybody to stay behind. Um, how does that <clears throat> impact your work? Are you able to get around safely or what? I mean, for us, the kind of work that we've been doing at the moment, ambulance work, being stationed in some of the mobile uh, uh, clinics and so on and so forth, and coordinating with Dr. Shadu, he's been letting us know where the hotspots are and so on and so forth. Um, of course, it's very difficult. We have to mud up our vehicles uh, so that we're not hit. Um, mud up our vehicles, what does that mean? <clears throat> that means literally, it's so primitive that literally we just slap uh, mud and soil all over our vehicles so that... Um, they basically camouflage in a sense um, how good of a job it does camouflage uh, from what I mean I understand this but I want to make sure that our target audience understands what it's like <clears throat> to deliver simple aid it's not like you know you just put the clothes there and somebody comes to pick them up what does that mean to put this I mean mud on the car? what we're saying is for example like I said to you before ambulances are being targeted so when we park our ambulances in a field or under trees we want it to look as close to the landscape as possible. So normally, whatever area that we're in, we'll use the same color soil uh, and cover our cars in it so that if a plane is flying over or drones are flying over, that they won't be as visible. Um, but like I said, they're using very high uh, quality uh, technology or precision technology, which is, is, mm. is really making it difficult. For example, one of the areas that I was working in, uh, a civil defense, um, base was hit and literally they had no vehicles left so this is why we came in we were helping them with vehicles that we had um, but it's very very difficult um, <clears throat> 10 hospitals <clears throat> why are we seeing hospitals systemically being attacked now why now Bilal, it's not new they've been taking out our hospitals or targeting medical staff from medical staff from the beginning of this conflict so so it's no surprise to us but unfortunately what has happened is that the international world has abandoned us us what i mean by us is the syrian people the people in syria helping the civilians the international world has kind of with the silence given the green light to Assad and Russia and said, you know what, you can do what you want to the population of Syria, you're not going to be held to account, bomb them with sarin, bomb them with chemicals, destroy all the hospitals, kill all the children, you know what, we're just going to turn a blind eye, maybe one, two words of condemnation, but you know what, do it again, who cares? And I, and I agree with him because this is a scary thing and this is what we were discussing earlier, the fact that right now Idlib is facing such an onslaught. It's not like before when Aleppo was going on and yourself were, were was uh, under siege and you know some of us broke the siege and came in. There was media attention and there was a lot more bloggers, a lot more exposure. People were making noise. Now we feel as if uh, nobody really cares. No one wants to hear about the situation. And this gives the green light for these regimes to do whatever they want. We're fearing another gas attack at the moment. Um, and, and this is the scary thing, we have to go everywhere we go with gas masks because we feel that you know, we could be subjected to an uh, attack. Um, okay, uh, you know, that he mentioned that, I just want to show everybody what it's like. Now, I'm a journalist, okay? And our team has to walk around with this. This is a gas mask because they've been known to use chlorine, <coughs> sarin, and other than that. So in order to do the job that we do, we have to walk around with a kit of, that includes uh, bandages and all kinds of uh, medical equipment, along with gas masks as well. Um, now, uh, I want to go back to a point that you just made mention of, and that's what role would you say the acceptance of the world in terms of what's happening to the Rohingya in Myanmar. Do you believe this gave a green light, if there wasn't a green light already, to Russian forces to say, hey, look, you've seen what took place in Myanmar. Nobody said anything. Go all out. 
what role do you think that plays? Um, I think I think the problem that we have here is that, um, what can I say? It's it's it's, it's difficult because. Myanmar is, is, is such a case where the atrocities that are taking place, likewise, again, we're not seeing uh, international condemnation. Um, I mean, people... Uh, a lot there's, of the, condemnation, there's, there's condemnation, but there's not much but there's, else. But there's no action. This is mm -hmm. what I mean. Condemnation is good. And to be honest with Myanmar, we've seen more of that. We've seen leaders like uh, uh, the Turkish leader Erdogan speak and, um, and, he, and put pressure on other people to try and speak. But... I feel for us, one of the problems that we face here is, for example, many people see Erdogan in a good light. Yes, he has done good things. But when it comes to Syria now, um, we're in a situation where we're abandoning us, in a sense. It's like uh, Rohingya, Burma has become the new Syria, in a sense. And this is the difficulty. The Ummah is going through such a crisis that trying to keep a spotlight on, on all of the issues that we're facing is, is, is very difficult. And it, we even feel unfair that, you know, we don't want to be taking the spotlight away from our brothers and sisters in, in, in Burma, but we have a duty here um, to try and show people this is what is taking place. What do you think? I think what it is, uh, we've, got, we've got to realise where this, this comes from, where this started. I think the, the silence of the world against the Russian government and the crimes that the, um, they are committing and Assad and the crimes they are committing has allowed the, the crimes against the Rohingyas to take place. I think if the world superpowers send out a strong message by dealing with these war cr criminals and terrorists like Putin and Assad, then the, the Burmese government would have fought um, twice before they carried out the massacre against the Rohingyas. So it, it is our silence to the, the massacring of the Syrian population. Now look at how many Syrians have been killed in this. You've got to understand, like, and, and where is that justice? That justice has not come yet. Uh, Do you understand what I'm saying, uh, Bila? I, I understand. Um, I just want to touch on something that Carolyn uh, <coughs> Marsden just uh, asked. And I'd like to reintroduce the, um, our guests here. Uh, right uh, to my right, we have uh, Tokia Talks Sharif, and um, he is an aid worker, and he is with uh, live updates from Syria. And we also have a uh, Dr. Shajul Islam, and he is a uh, uh, medical doctor, and uh, they're helping us to get a perspective in terms of what's been happening over the past, uh, let's say, week to ten days. Um, <coughs> Uh, uh, and this new onslaught, which we are, which we are seeing, uh, ten hospitals destroyed, eleven mosques destroyed. Uh, you know, we have a difference in terms of airstrikes. We're talking about hundreds, perhaps into the thousand, uh, a range of airstrikes. Um, and uh, this is what we're discussing. We got your questions pouring in. We're going to get to those questions uh, uh, in a minute. But uh, I just want to continue with my guests here before we do that. Um, We have a situation around the Ummah where if something happens, the Ummah will come and give money. If, if an airstrike comes and there's nobody to pay for the, the burial plots, you will find that they will come. And I'm just being honest here because I think honesty is something that is going to help to dig us out of the situation that we're in. You'll find people who will donate towards burial plots. <clears throat> you will find people who will donate towards after effects. But these preemptive measures in uh, uh, contacting one's government, um, um, writing articles, making sure that people know what's going on. I just wanna, I just wanna talk to our tech team and everything. I'd like for you to display uh, uh, something here that we talked about. Uh, I noticed that during this crisis, there was one article on CNN. During this crisis, there was one article about this crisis on Al Jazeera. I noticed BBC didn't carry a single article regarding this crisis. But there are plenty of articles about Donald Trump. Uh, uh, saying Kim Jong-un is this and this one is that and so on and so forth. Stuff that we've heard millions of times. But these things are not demanded. So I am saying to you, hopefully we are displaying now the, um, uh, 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 the Twitter accounts for uh, CNN. At CNN. 
Also, we've got at uh, Al Jazeera English. We've also got at BBC News. Why don't you send them a, uh, a, a message, a tweet, or something and say, hey, why aren't you covering this? Isn't this important? More important than that, that, that girl that, that just got pregnant or something everybody's talking about, um, or whatever, some, some actress or something, or singing. <clears throat> thing. Everybody's looking I, have, like I have no everybody's idea. Like they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but the reality of the situation is that we're talking about a whole bunch of stuff that's got nothing to do with the price of tea in China. So I want to come back to the two of you. Give us some practical <clears throat> things that people can walk away from this conversation and say, I'm not going to bed tomorrow night until I do. I think what it is, you've touched on something very important, Bilal. Um, this time around, and when I say this time around, what we're saying is the last week or 10 days, as Bilal highlighted, Idlib is being ignored. You know, the hundreds of people that have been killed, that I've been seeing myself, the th over thousands of people we've been treating, that we've amputated, you know, the newly, new, new, newly children that have lost their parents, that are orphans now, have got no one to look after. You know what? None of the outlets, none of the major outlets have given it any serious attention. And that is very worrying. That is very worrying because we are seeing the narrative they're trying to push in Idlib. They're trying to make it out like, you know what, it lives all full of terrorists. You just kill them all. Kill them. Uh, even that little kid is a terrorist. Oh, he's going to grow up to be a terrorist. So we might as well just kill them all now. And this is what the world silence is, is signaling to, to the real terrorists out there, like the Assad regime uh, the, and, and, and Russia. So what we need to do is we need the world to see the suffering of the Syrian people. We need every single one of you to help us make awareness of what is happening here. What do you want them to do? Retweet? Write articles? I want Look. to give some practical steps that they can walk away with. I hear you. Look. I, I, of course, this is not my specialty. Social media is not my specialty. So I need the e experts out there to come on board with the campaigns and help us spread the word. You know, when Aleppo was going down, when Aleppo was burning, we had an outcry. We had protests. We had people writing to the MPs. We had people protesting with the government. Look, you know what is? We need the experts to give us practical uh, instructions. I've been contacted by a new campaign that's going to start, uh, I believe, on Sunday. It's going to be certain hashtags. I believe uh, it's going to be Free Syria or whatever it is. There's already a Idlib's burning hashtag trending. You know, I mean, you guys will know how well that is and how well that works. But what I need you to do is make awareness. One thing I've seen is, you know, if you go to some of these news outlets, Twitter page or whatnot, and in the comments section, you just flood it with the pictures and the horrific images that are coming out of Idlib. So people can't ignore it. You need to flood the pages with your comments. Why are you ignoring Idlib, you know? You know, you guys that are like social media experts out there, help us, you know. I'm a doctor, you know, like... SubhanAllah, the last two weeks, you know, I've been in the hospital like near enough every day, maybe one day I took out, you know, we are overwhelmed, overwhelmed with patients. And in that time, the medical facilities I've been working in have been hit five, six, seven times. I'm talking about one facility that's been repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly targeted. So this is what I'm going through. And for me to try to give you strategies on media while I'm trying to save the lives of so many people, it'll be like, it's going to be tricky. But you guys out there that, that you know more about this stuff, please help us. How are we going to work together? Come and give us some comments. Like right now, this is live, right? So if anyone out there's got some suggestion, how we're going to make awareness of what's going on, please help us out. I think uh, what I would say, I think all of us, the three of us sitting here, we understand how important media is because um, what a lot of governments try to do, um, what a lot of uh, people try to do is turn a blind eye to these things. But when it becomes uh, apparent, for example, the same thing happened with Sheikh Hasina, uh, the leader of Bangladesh. Um, if you heard some of her comments before pressure started to be applied In towards Shilisha. her, mm -hmm. she had to do a backtrack because the pressure was so much. So we can make a difference. The first and most important thing to understand is that we have to believe that we can make a difference. Then we need to be active. So what I would say is we need to bring our community groups together. Anyone that's there that knows maybe any uh, famous YouTubers or, or bloggers or whatever it is, we need to get these people on board. We need to try getting the message out there. I know uh, we're getting old, but we need the youth. It's the youth. Uh, Bilal's growling at me. But we need the youth to really carry this forward because, 
You know, a lot of the change, even in the time of the Prophet was carried by the youth. And, and this is what's needed. We need, I mean, for me, a practical step. What I say to all the brothers and sisters out there is we want a long-term strategy. We need people not to just give with their amwal or with their wealth. We need people to give with their anfus, with their own selves. They need to make this a time. And one of the beautiful things that I've seen uh, in the aid field is I remember, you know, eight, nine years ago, uh, when I started, you would contact the aid organization. You'd say, look, uh, I'd like to do some uh, voluntary work with you. And they'd ask you for all of these requirements and so on and so forth. Mm. But today, for example, with Burma, you see many people are taking that initiative, mm. getting up, going to Bangladesh, going to Burma. They're doing the work firsthand. And that gives them a connection to the field. This is a great step. Likewise, in the political field, in the social media field, people need to take this initiative and they really need to get involved because if we don't take them steps today, in five years' time, in ten years' time, we'll be sitting here or people will be watching these screens with the same atrocities because we haven't taken, taken no long-term steps. And, and that's what's important. We have to build institutions, um, stuff like Five Pillars, it's, it's amazing, it gives a, a voice to uh, uh, the Muslim community, OGN for example, in, in the, in the f- uh, theatre of war, and we need more stuff like this, the Middle East Eye. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is very, very important for the Muslim community. You know, I think one thing that a lot of people <clears throat> don't realize is that they feel that if it's not happening on a CNN or an Al Jazeera or a BBC or other than them, it's not happening. Yeah. And right now what we're seeing is that uh, it's not happening on those news outlets. Why aren't they reporting it? You know what, I've got a a suspicious eye that I'm looking at here because I'm hearing from some of them when I contact them that, well, well, they're not reporting it because uh, Donald Trump is dominating the airways. I don't Mm. believe that because I'm seeing other stories that are there. Look, I mean, we all know that every government has its own politics and its own benefits in a sense. So, for example, I I was given an example that when I was on the Mavi Mamra, for example, the Turks, because their allies were the Pakistanis and uh, the Qataris and and, and so on and so forth, these were the only media outlets that were on the ship with us, for example, Al Jazeera, Press TV, and they were covering the ship, whereas... Uh, allies of Israel, like uh, the BBC and many of these other outlets, CNN and so on, so they didn't want anything to do with it. Why? Um, because it's not in their interest, a ship with aid going to Israel and showing Israel as the bad guy. For them, no, Israel is, you know, uh, the saviour. Likewise, in this situation, unfortunately, the people of Syria, uh, the civilians, they don't have a friend. Of course, you see Bashar, for example, he has friends in, in Lebanon, in Iran, and in Russia. But unfortunately, the people that have been abandoned in this situation are the Syrian people. And that's why us, as uh, the, the people of conscience out there, we have to take this upon ourselves. And we can do it. We can make a change using our own social medias, uh, doing Twitter storms, and so on and so forth. Um, don't uh, belittle uh, any deed. You know, Just clicking a button, just sharing right now. Look, three of us have come here from different locations in Syria, you know, we've had to go through many security precautions to get here. Um, and there's intense bombing going on right now as we speak. But we've come here because we believe this is so important that, you know, if we speak about this issue and people understand this is very serious right now, my dear brothers and sisters. Wallahi, I cannot stress how important it is. Look, Dr. Shadu could be in a hospital right now saving lives. He's left a hospital to come here. You know, Bilal would be documenting somewhere else. We've all come together to try and strengthen and unify this message and this is what we need everybody who's watching now to do also. I think you know what it is, if I can touch on what you said very briefly, you know we're sitting in a very nice studio and um, I'm not sure, you can't really see what we're sitting in, <laughs> but don't, don't, come on bro, for Syria this is nice man. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I wish, Alhamdulillah. I wish, I wish you guys could really see what you know. He says it's nice, but you know, people are gonna think we're sitting in some beautiful. Yo, studio. Bilal, uh, um, uh, you know? <laughs> yeah, it talks, bro. If if you knew where I was about two hours ago, this is beautiful, man. Yeah. I, Come I'm just, on. I'm just trying to make the viewers understand we're not sitting in a beautiful studio. You know, there's like the lights are like plastic buckets. And, you know, I'm not cussing, I'm not cussing Bilal's studio, Marshall, it's amazing. Hey, don't explore. <laughs> to continue my line of questioning here. Um, yes, Can I make you, my point? You were saying something. Look, look, I don't, I don't think people understand the, what we've had to, uh, what I've, let me just tell you from my perspective. About three hours ago, I was in the middle of operation, okay? I knew Bilal's giving me a time, I need to be certain place, okay? 
we rushed and I was hoping to leave before sunset because we know the machine guns come out after after sunset. I, I'm sorry, explain to them what you took. Machine guns not like the old Tommy old guns Tommy or, or whatever. Explain uh, to night them what time. Uh, They call it here Harbi Rashash. It's a basically a fighter jet which has, what was these guns? 37 milli cannons or whatever you call them. Yeah. Some I mean, rotating gun. It's strange What's because, it called? It's strange uh, because you all kind of started to learn about weapons here, you know, when uh, it's it's when you live in a situation where you have to duck and dodge from these uh, no. You know types of, 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 of war weaponry you start to learn and understand right when this kind of uh, Plane comes yeah. out, you know, I need to hide in a certain yeah. way and when this type of plane comes out I need to hide in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So what we have here just to add to what uh, the doctor saying We have something called Marsat here, which is uh, radios um, where there's certain people they have uh, certain frequency uh, uh, receptors which tell us which kind of planes are flying in the air, how many planes are flying and so what the doctor's talking about is a type of weapon which is basically like a machine gun connected to a, a, a fire jet. jet which basically just shoots out anything with lights man anything with lights on any road it will just spray spray bullets and we're talking about high caliber, large, large. Uh, bullets that would... They're like this big, bro. You know? I'm not even joking. They're like this big. Imagine this big bullet coming at you. Um, so going back to my point. So I rushed out of that surgery, finished it up. And I do apologize for being late, Bilal. Um, it's night time now. And we are driving down as fast as possible. Why? Because this... Uh, Harbi Rashash is called here, came out. It was exactly above us, the road we were going down. The guy, the brother that was with me is like, bro, this plane is above us. This plane is above us. I'm like, bro, we're getting late. Yeah, normally we'll pull up and wait. This time I took my chances and I just kept driving. As soon as I reached where I am now, the brother said, you know where the route you took, a car got shot at and got taken out. So that was a few cars behind me. This is the reality of the war zone we live in. And this is how important it is for me to come here and meet Bilal so that I can get your attention, I can get your help because we need your help. We need the world to see what's going on here because no one's really paying attention to the hundreds of people that are dying. And you know, so I just want you brothers and sisters and everyone worldwide to take this seriously. Okay, and uh, you know, maybe there are people out there who are not paying attention. And we don't care what happened yesterday, but we care about what's going to happen tomorrow, inshallah. This is your opportunity. Whatever it is, you have a pen and a piece of paper and you write down, I'm not going to bed tomorrow till I go and make an appointment with my uh, minister of parliament or, or, or my state senator or my congressman or something like that to ask them, what are you doing about Idlib? And you may have to play this video for them to educate them. Go on the uh, OGN.news website and look for some articles, look for some information. It's there. So um, we need for everybody to be active. <clears throat> the least, the bare minimum that you could do outside of making dua and sincere supplication is to share, retweet, let people know exactly what's going on. Now, um, okay, uh, we have uh, 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 jets in the sky now, um, you know, that uh, circle above us all the time. This is just the life that we have to live here. A lot of people don't really realize that. That I was just took on a, a brief point about the Harbor of Shashi that he was talking about. Okay, um, what we would have to do when we were in, in Aleppo is that when, the, when this plane would come, it has to dip low so that it can get a clear shot at you. So you would literally have to go on a street from shadow to shadow. You would get to one shadow and then you would have to run across the street to get to the next shadow. Because when they're shooting these 37 millimeter bullets at you, it can penetrate a, 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 a brick wall. So your best thing to do is not to be seen. But this is what we have to do and how we have to travel where it's so easy just to go from one place to another, hop on the motorway. For here, this is not really the situation. Now, now I've got a question here, and I'm just going to start throwing these questions out. I'm going to start with um, uh, you, Tox. Um, what are the neighboring Arab nations doing? Uh, the neighboring Arab nations are doing nothing. Um, I mean, Jordan. Jordan is 
I don't know, Jordan is very, I don't even, I, you don't even hear anything. You know, Jordan, if anyone's been to Jordan, people know that Jordan is like a police state. Um, it's very difficult to travel. You've got more Palestinians in Jordan than, than Jordanians, I think. So uh, we don't expect anything from Jordan, to be honest, which is very sad. Uh, Lebanon, of course, is an ally. You've got Hezbollah militias there, which are allies to Bashar al-Assad, and they're actually killing the Syrian people. Um, or sending them back to Israel. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, so, um, what other neighboring countries do we have? Iraq. Iraq. Iraq is in a mess itself. Um, so and sending in reinforcements and, and, and of Shia. Plenty, mm. Yeah, that's right. There, there are plenty of uh, of Iraqi death squads that mm. have come from Iraq, um, and they've come here to fight on the side of Bashar al Assad. And we've also got Israel. Um, Israel is just taking pop shots at Syria whenever it feels like and bombing random places. Mm. So, to be honest, the neighbours here are not really doing much, especially when we're talking about the Arab nations, and, and unfortunately that's very, very sad. Um, I think it's, it's very important that a lot of the Arab brothers and sisters out there become more engaged with their communities and putting pressure on their leaders um, um, when it comes to these issues. Um, you know, I want to touch on a subject because there's many people that, when it comes to Saudi Arabia and the Haramain, they're very protective over uh, King Salman and, and, and the crown and they say that they're doing amazing work and so on and so forth. But we never hear any statements from them on Syria. Okay, the people who love and revere, uh, for example, Saudi Arabia, which is one of the powerhouses, why is there no push uh, for uh, some kind of political action or, or at least trying to ask these leaders, look, why do you have no statement uh, when it comes to Syria or I, Idlib? I, I'm sorry, I... I, I, I... I disagree. Look, <clears throat> the reality of the situation is that the resources of a country like Saudi Arabia don't, the, they don't belong to the Saud family. It's not their personal property, you see? Um, and when we're talking about, he just made a deal with Donald Trump for like $400 billion for advanced weaponry. And the best you can do is a statement of condemnation? No, I, I, I'm not To be honest, I'll be happy if they would even give a statement of con condemnation, I haven't even heard a statement of condem condemnation from, 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 from example, Saudi Arabia. I, or, I can or understand what you're saying. And th that, okay, I, what you're saying I, of is course, of give course, we expect, you know, give us something, you right. know. But I'm saying <clears throat> is that if I've got $10 million and you're just looking to buy a meal and I buy you, you know, uh, two old stale cookies. No, man, you got to come with something better than that, especially because the, <clears throat> all of that that they have, that they flaunt around, that they spend millions of dollars on vacations and such like that in Morocco, the reality is that it's not your personal property, you know, and that goes for the Qataris, that goes for the Kuwaitis, it goes for, the, uh, for all the rest of them. We as an Ummah have not evolved past simply giving aid, <clears throat> blankets and flashlights, and, uh, but I but mean, what, that's, what that's I'm saying know. is, for that to change, okay, I know that a lot of these uh, Arabian countries, for example, they don't have, um, in a sense, a political process. But for that to change, we have to have people from them countries putting pressure on their leaders and saying, look, we can't allow this to happen. You know, one thing that we have in the West is that you do see people of conscience speaking and saying, look, this is not right. Mm. Whereas... Muslims or non-Muslims? Muslims or non-Muslims, non whereas uh, unfortunately in uh, the Arab world, I, I, I don't see it personally, so maybe if I'm ill-informed, maybe some of the brothers and sisters that are watching could tell me differently. Okay. Can I just uh, touch on what... Questions. Yeah, sure, I'll come to that. I'll just touch on a few things. There's a few points I want to make on what, what Tox just said about the neighbouring countries. I'm actually working with doctors in Dera, so I know the situation south quite well. You'd be surprised with how much Israel is doing. Israel is doing a lot more than Jordan, a huge amount more. You know that. What do you mean in terms of supporting yeah. the Syrian people? Supporting the Syrian people and giving aid. Really? Do you know the only way to get aid to Dera is through the IDF? Do you know that? Nobody. I've been trying to get aid to Dera for a long time. Jordan totally blocked off the, 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 the border and anyone goes towards it, they shoot at them, what so not. What, what you're seeing in effect is that the Israelis have yeah. more humanity than no doubt. the Jordanians. Definitely. <laughs> and not just the normal Israelis, I'm talking about the IDF. Zionists, you know, Zionists. The yeah. IDF, the military. Wow. The Israeli military. But what's their stake in this? Because, you know, they're not doing us, as we say in New York, doing us a solid. I mean, look, what the hidden agenda is, who cares? Uh, uh, my mistake, sorry, who knows? 
But what I can tell you from the doctors that I'm talking to down there, they are so desperate because so many of our Muslim brothers and sisters are dying because they ain't got medicine, they ain't got surgical equipment, they ain't got nothing. That, you know what, that, that bit that the Israel is giving them is a lifeline for so many of our Muslims. Oh, no, I never knew that. All right, okay. um, I want to ask you a question that we have here. Uh, so I'm going to start with you here. Uh, Erdogan is meeting, this is from Shafqul Islam, and I hope that I pronounced his name right, Shafqul? Shafqul, no. Um, Erdogan is meeting with Putin today to discuss the region's security issues. Um, okay, where did it go? Um, uh, security issues, including the war. Aren't Erdogan and Putin not on different sides of the war? Are they on different sides of the war? Who are you asking? It's, Talks on me. A, well, I started the, the question last time with him, now I'm going to start with you. <laughs> Look, you know what it is? I got to say, uh, whatever people might think of Erdogan, uh, I, I got to say, Turkey, out of all the countries, has been the most helpful. Whatever we think of Erdogan and the foreign policy and whatnot. From my perspective as, as a medic, I would have thought so too, that Turkey, uh, Erdogan and Putin would be on totally opposing sides. But you know what, things have become so strange and unclear right now. And, and I'm confused, I'm hoping Bilal, you're going to help me out here and explain to me what is going on. Well, um, I think that uh, Turkey, and Russia want to see an end to the war. And they want to see the end of the war as soon as possible. But they also want to see differ, different uh, uh, things happen. For example, Turkey would like to see uh, um, an end. They would like to see the rebel forces to be successful. Which of those rebel forces is a different topic that, 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 is, that needs a show in and of itself. Um, Certain things got to be borne in mind here. Turkish homes are heated by Russian gas. I have to say that this plays a role because if Turkey decides all of a sudden that they want to come out more forcefully, first of all, Russia is much more powerful than they are. So they cannot actually be a real guarantor of any deal. In addition to that, it's too easy for Putin simply to turn that gas off so that a, a country full of Turkish homes have no gas to heat their homes. These are realities that a lot of people um, don't see. Of course, uh, Russia wants to maintain its, um, its military uh, bases uh, here in Syria. Uh, they like to see the puppet, uh, I mean Bashar al-Assad, is that his name? Okay. Um, they like to see him remain in the position that he's in. He actually controls very little of Syria, but the reality of the situation is that Russia um, is his, uh, their allies and they want to see him remain. Okay, um, I think that we are here now. Uh, I've got another question um, here. Uh, will there be a strategic victory over the rebels? Uh, only Allah knows. You know, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, for people who don't know, um, there is a, uh, 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 the group known as HTS, or Hayat Tahrir Shem. Um, they have ongoing skirmishes um, with, uh, on, with uh, opposing forces. So um, that's I think, an update. I think for, for, for myself, as an aid worker, the important thing here is that until this political mess is sorted out, the main uh, casualties or victims are the Syrian people. And this is what we're mm -hmm. getting that okay politics aside uh who is you know facing the consequence of this it's the normal syrians you know we put a video up yesterday of an old grandma 70 years old what is her crime in all of this except for the fact that she wanted to just stay in her village in her home um, and live out the rest of her, her her life and and this is what we need to understand yes there's a lot of politics involved we need to try and uh, push that message to the leaders i believe that erdogan has uh, got some good intentions, but many other Muslim leaders, okay, uh, and I say Muslim leaders need to have pressure put on them so that they have to make statements. This is, you know, our leaders reflect us in a sense. So their silence is a, a, a reflection of our silence in a sense. So we've got to understand that if we're from Pakistan, if we're from Bangladesh, we saw it in Bangladesh in terms of Myanmar, the right pressure was applied and their leaders spoke. 
with all the Pakistanis that are watching uh, from any of the Arab countries, we have to start putting ourselves in positions where we can apply pressure to these people when we need to. And maybe stop, you know, uh, now, uh, schedule. This is what I want to ask you. A lot of times people are going to sit back and they're going to say, look, <clears throat> the government's going to handle that. This is a Muslim government. They've got this. I'm just one guy. What can I do? Is there... Uh, I mean, do you support that everything has to go through a government or can individuals also make a real difference? Ultimately, the main difference I'm seeing on the ground here in Syria is not so much from governments. It's from individual people. I mean, you know, we shouldn't belittle the deed, the smallest of deeds that you guys are doing back there. You know, yeah, I know Bilal, you pointed out a few times that there are, um, you know, most people think just giving charity is sufficient. Although it might not be sufficient, it is actually crucial. It is actually very important, you know. You know, today, for example, we run out of so many supplies of so many drugs in our hospital. You know, we are literally begging from hospital to hospital saying, please help us. And sadly, a lot of the bigger charities are now cutting funding because Idlib is full of terrorists. And this is the reason they're using to pull out funding. And this is the reasoning they're using to stop, for example, tea or sugar or these kind of items, as you would know a lot more about, coming in into Idlib. So right now, we're going to be depending on, of course, first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then people like you, because... Is it, it possible that if they're cutting like uh, tea and sugar and things of this nature, that people could put containers of this stuff together? Is that possible to do? The problem is, is that um, it becomes complicated, in, but it's still possible. The situation is that it's becoming like a blockade in a sense. Yeah. This is what many people don't understand because of the pressures that are maybe being put on Erdogan. Um, the rules are changing. Uh, for example, this is something recent that's happened where tea, uh, sugar, uh, any um, uh, fish products, meat. This has all been banned. Toys are now banned. Stationery is now banned. Kitchen items. The only things that are allowed is medical equipment. Um, certain uh, clothing and shoes and certain types of food. Hold up, hold up. You said medical equipment. Do you know for the last two months how much difficulty we are, I've been having with medical equipment? Get, getting mm, yeah. getting them in, getting them in. They, for example, I had so a... It, it arrives in Turkey, is that how it Yeah, works? it comes to Babel Har border, okay. it goes through customs, customs say, ah, it's an x-ray machine, ah, it's not really medical. See, see, the thing is, how is the x-ray machine not medical? They sent an x-ray machine back last time, x-ray machine and a few is, other machines. Yeah, we've, we've faced the same difficulty because we're not sure if this is um, something that Turkey is doing economically. We don't know what the reasons for this are because we can purchase the equipment in Turkey and bring it in. That's not a problem, which is much more difficult for us. Normally, we have people donate items and they come on containers uh, like medical equipment and so on and so forth. And now we're having problems like we don't understand why would Turkey ban, for example, stationery for schools? Why would they ban children's toys, uh, kitchen equipment? You know, is this going to be used? for aiding terrorism, uh, or is this something economically that Turkey wants people to purchase these items in Turkey? We're not exactly sure, but all we know that there's a lot of changes that are happening on the ground here. Many charities are pulling out, and this is why we do need more people to step up. We need more individuals. individuals. Um, going back to your original point, I firmly believe that people uh, carry the power, and people can definitely make change. History proves that, and today is the day for us to stand up and make that difference. Whatever it is, and however we get together, we need to plan, we need to make it our life's work that, you know what, we're going to try and make a change here. All right, uh, we're just about out of time. So I'm going to ask you, um, we probably got about 30 seconds apiece. Um, if there's something that you would like to say to the people that you think that they don't know or are not clear on, and you would make, like to make sure that they are clear on, you got 30 seconds. Look them in the eye. What do you want to say? Look, I'm seeing the people that are being injured. The world and Russia are going to try to fool you into thinking that these are all terrorists we're killing.
But I'm telling you, that little boy that I saw yesterday die, that grandmother that came in earlier today, these are civilians and majority, majority of the people that are the victims here are civilians, normal civilians in Syria. Now, of course, you're sitting at home thinking you can't do much. You can, you can help us make awareness that these are civilians that are targets, Idlib is not full of terrorists, and that that is the first thing. Second thing is that a lot of our facilities are getting bombed out, we lost so much equipment, we're struggling, struggling to save lives. I need your help to repurchase some of these equipment. So please check out my website www.medicalaidsyria.com and I desperately need you to make a donation so that we can purchase equipment which we can still do from Turkey and bring them into Syria. You? What I would say is that every single person that's watching right now, um, you know, share these videos understand that this is an obliga obligation upon every single one of us. At the end of the day, Allah uh, is not going to ask us about the results. What is required is that we try to help these people. I want everyone to imagine that if it was their own brother or their own sister or their own mother or their own father, you would do ev every single thing that it takes to alleviate their suffering. And as Muslims, we should understand that you know we are, 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 are brothers in Islam and to see the, the, the fate of these people and not do nothing, in a sense, makes us complicit. So wallahi, my dear brothers and sisters, do whatever you can. I know sometimes it feels like we're helpless and we can't do much, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. If you sit there for an hour and just click share, 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 Allah knows exactly what you're doing. Even if you call people and you have no response, Allah knows that you tried and that is what is, is required from us, inshallah. Okay. Um Unfortunately, we're going to have to end this session. I'd like to thank Dr. Shajul Islam for coming down and uh, uh, Tawqiyah Talks Sharif um, also for, uh, from uh, live updates from Syria uh, for coming. Um, it's not easy for us all to get together. Uh, <coughs> some people might say it's not even a good idea for us all to be in the same room together. So um, I am Bilal Abdul Kareem. This has been Face the Truth. Please visit our website, www.ogn.news. We are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on YouTube, and we are out. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.